Um, this material was uh, in an earlier version co-developed with my friend and colleague Paolo Castagna. Those are our email addresses. A.O is apache.org. Um, and this presentation, or uh, an, an initial version of this presentation, was first given at the ApacheCon conference in Europe at the end of last year, when we were very lucky in that, in that location. We actually had people from both styles of graph databases in the same room, and that proved to be a very useful discussion because uh, graph databases are not exactly very common in the world. The fact that there are multiple different kinds and approaches, there are actually two very, very different communities and it's grown up on both sides, driven by completely different environment and, and um, uh, problem solving to address. Yet, they're both based around this fun uh, fundamental idea. So at some level, they're the same. And when you get down to the details, they're actually very different. And having those two groups of people actually talk to each other for once, um, because they tend to go to different conferences, they tend to move in different circles, and they tend to be solving different business problems, generated a lot of overlap, and it was quite an exciting place for uh, that conversation to happen. Um, if you have any questions as I go along, feel free to ask them at the time. Don't wait until the end. Um, it's a small audience, so um, if you, there are things you don't understand, please say so. That's my fault. I will want, want to correct it, because if you don't understand because I've gabbled on something, somebody else is probably finding it difficult to understand as well. So this is about two graph data models. We'll look at a little bit about what graphs are. Um, we'll, just to, to frame the sort of world that we are both coming from, we'll look at the data models that they both have. Um, and then I'll look at how you can combine them together and um, give some ideas on what is a good idea to take from one to the other and ways that I think are actually a bad way about thinking about how to combine them um, because there are certain trends that people uh, uh, advocate that I think will go, not actually give very much benefit. So that's really the sort of um, gist of the, of the outline. Um, so first question to you is how many people here have used a graph database at all? That's more than I often get. It's great. Yeah. There aren't many people in the world, and so we tend to be a bit diverse. Um, who's used a property graph database? Who's used an RDF database? Even numbers for once. Property graphs are currently uh, you know, probably more common and uh, things. There are other graph data models. Oracle's a sponsor here. Oracle have a um, support their own uh, the network graph model. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Um, to some extent, I mean, the graphs, they're, they're, all, they're all the same and they're all different. Um, but we could talk about these two just to draw out the contrasts. What I say is actually going to be quite applicable to some of the variations on them. First of all, who am I? Who's talking? Um, uh, you might, I'm a Committer, uh, sorry, a committer on some Apache projects. The one I commit to most is called Apache Jenna. Um, and I work for a company called Top Quadrant who make uh, information management tools based on RDF. We use that to capture the data, we use that to display, and we're very explicit to the users that they are working with RDF. It's not a technology that's hidden behind the scenes that solves a particular problem. We're talking with information scientists, with data scientists, and they know they are working with RDF. They actually manipulate the data directly, and sometimes they will edit it directly um, in their systems. So this is RDF in front of you kind of, kind of tools. Um, I've been involved in some of the linked data standards for a while. Linked data, if you don't know, is just a, for this purpose of the talk, a synonym for RDF. Um, it tends to emphasize more on the data combination, the data reuse between organizations, and RDF is kind of a bit more of the technology, but the difference is kind of uh, not particularly um, important for the purposes of this talk. Um, the particular standards I've been involved with are the query language called Sparkle and the data formats for RDF. As I said, I contribute to Apache Jenna, um, and I work for Top Quadrant. 
So graphs. Why graphs? First of all, the slide actually has a subtext, which is we're not talking about graphs with X and Y axes and squiggly lines and, and colour schemes. We're talking about graphs to capture interesting data structures. So something almost as simple as an org chart that it naively looks like a tree, because you have the manager, you know, have the head of the company at the top and he has his reports and he has the reports underneath that, does not reflect how companies actually work. This was a graphic that I found on the internet somewhere, another one of fair use, because I don't have the copyright for it, that captures a number of different companies. And you can try and say which ones they are. Um, the original slide actually has the names of the companies on them. Um, but it's capturing the idea that there are companies that do organize as a tree. That, that would reflect how the organization works. Uh, this one down here, not which one it is, has a very different way of doing it, where there's one centre thing and everything captures. So how would you build something that captures that sort of data in such a way that you're not building something that's specifically for this or specifically for that kind of thing? So you want to capture the idea of how an organisation relates to each other. So you're getting data that can be looked very different ways and you're getting data that probably changes over time and probably changes for all sorts of reasons, like if you look at one part of a company, a large enterprise, it might organise in a very different way to another part of the company. And if you want to make something that captures that knowledge from your enterprise, how are you going to do it? One possibility is a graph database because it can capture these kind of networks um, naturally. It doesn't assume that there's a single regimented organized way that can be turned into tables can be turned into something uh, much more on the structured end of, of data so what sort of use reference data um, life sciences do a lot of um, this sort of thing for publishing ontology for, um, for publishing reference data and there are a number of forces that drive them to using um, uh, graph databases, one of which is they keep changing how much they know, for, which is good for, because a lot of this is medical. They want to keep adding to that data in ways that wasn't originally planned, but they don't want to invalidate all the old data. It's not like when you publish the next version of, of SNOMED, which is a list of clinical terms, that because they've added a new area, you have to go and re-engineer the data modeling of some area that actually hasn't changed very much. A graph database is good at having different data organizations in different places in it. They use RDF because it's a standard, because it's neutral. In this particular life sciences area, key reference data comes from Charitable institutions, which are huge in life sciences, they, they essentially drive the structure of the research end of the things, or national institutions, whether it's the National Institute of Health in, in the US or, or other uh, um, uh, national organizations, and they don't want to be specific to a particular vendor. Um, they, they're looking at producing data that has long-term asset value, and the... Uh, the pharmaceutical companies, the life sciences companies, are taking this data at the beginning of the research pipeline. So, you know, there are lots of money involved at this stage, and neutrality about formats so nobody has any control is very important to make them acceptable. Similarly, vocabularies, by which I mean just list of terms, just something as simple as the catalogue of some organisation, every, every stock control unit they put on the shelf details of that. That's reference data that they can build information <coughs> systems around. Um, as Lists of, of SKUs, of stock control units, are they're just huge because <coughs> everything on that shelf has a unique number that says what kind of thing it is um, for any, any kind of thing. Um, shareable data. Uh, all the info boxes from Wikipedia have been captured and turned into a big database called DBpedia. So those are all knowledge management kind of uh, knowledge-based um, things, but also graphs give you analysis, looking for patterns in the data, looking for things. So one 
uh, example of that is uh, Cray, based in Bristol, across the, the water there. Um, they use uh, graph databases for fraud analysis in a uh, large um, cable provider based in North Bristol. Um, they're talked about the public, it's Virgin Media, and they're looking for patterns that show fraud is going on in some way. Um, extracting information in the finance industry um, who have very, very large amounts of data and where even quite small insights into the data can make very big differences to their profitability. So they, they're very interested in capturing data in all sorts of ways and then deciding how they're going to use it and look for the patterns within it. A social graphs, um, so that's a more general idea of, of the org chart, capturing how, whether it's um, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or um, uh, uh, social graphs of robots or something like that. It's a, it's a kind of world where graph databases can provide the flexibility at some cost. They're not as fast as traditional databases, if nothing else because traditional databases have had 25 years head start and $25 billion worth of R&D investment. But also, there's fundamentally less for the computer to get hold of to do things in efficient ways because of the flexibility. So other use cases on the analytics front, uh, social networks, recommendation engines, you're actually using these quite a lot. Um, if you go to Google and you look up a restaurant and it tells you it's opening times, there's a good chance that is driven off a graph um, from schema.org where uh, um, web pages are annotated with information about, and it's hidden in the web page, about opening times and Google just slurp it out. What Google are doing is providing the vocabulary and the terminology so people can put it in web pages so they can go and scrape it to make their engines look better. But anyone can take that information. It is a web of data that they are creating. Um, another one I quite like is, uh, I've come across this a couple of times, is organizations start experimenting with graph databases in their domain of, in, uh, of business. Um, but the one they actually find it very useful is actually running their business. Um, Tracking what's in your data center is surprisingly difficult at scale. Um, and the really good question is, if I walk up to this rack of computers and I rip the power cord out the back, what stops working? Because by the time you've got high-level applications using microservices, using databases, moving files, they're running in virtual machines, which you can move from machine to machine, to actually know, because those are different layers of, of responsibility and engineering teams about what's going on, it's actually quite difficult to have that picture of which applications, high-level things sitting up here, are using the nasty hardware down at the bottom so that when you turn the hardware off, it has an effect. You may know where you put them originally, but then somebody's optimized where the VMs are running, so they've moved them. They've moved between machines, they've moved between racks, they've moved between data centers. So it's actually quite difficult to know what's going to be impacted. Um, one quite scary one is an organization um, only had one way of finding out, which was by turning it off and seeing what happened. Um, and they were just being honest about it. So they were very interested in, uh, in, in using graphs to capture all the information from those different levels because different groups could then take out what they needed to do to get it. They could create an asset for running their, their data. Another one, knowledge graphs, happenings, people, places, and events is a very common way in anything driven from history or recording happenings. Um, and the happenings tends to be also in national security issues, modeling things like that, and having well-founded principles about what it means to make an observation. Um, just because you have seen a ship go by, A, you might be wrong, uh, B, when it happened, what you used, you know, how much of the silhouette you could see, all sorts of stuff um, relates to what the quality of that observation is. And if you've got things saying that collect information from lots of different observations, what you record about observing a ship might be different from what you observe about um, in internet traffic that you, you've monitored. And the other one that, that is kind of happening is uh, 
product catalogues and knowledge graphs across the organization and be able to react to situations. Um, a, uh, a large company is working with us to build a catalog of all the products and what, and what those ca uh, products are made of. So they can answer the question when a large, in this case American, very large chain of uh, um, uh, supermarkets phones up and says, there's been a report that such and such a chemical com uh, causes cancer. Which of your products are affected? If it's the government phoning up, life's actually quite easy in the sense that government's quite relaxed. If you can give us the answer in six months, they might be quite happy about that. The commercial world wants the answer in like a week to be able to react to the bad publicity that might, that might, might go through. So those questions come in after you've collected the data rather than there's some application that can already answer this question. So how do you, how do you have data that you can react to situations. And graph database is one approach to, to, to explore there because you can just chuck everything in and then decide how you're going to use it later. There are, it's unfair to say there are two, but the two I'm going to talk about are RDF, Resource Description Framework. Uh, we're in the, a media center. It is not the company with the same name. There is a large media company called IDF, which gets confusing when you're doing Google searches. That's based around W3C standards, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, it's grown up, and in fact, Bristol has actually been, Bristol University, um, and people there uh, started a lot of the work about, I was going to say 10 years ago, but I think it's longer than ago. Uh, along with that, I think Simon here was knew, knew those people back in the day. Worked with them, um, so it's it's actually got a strong Bristol connection. It's very been very open in the way it's developed. It's always gone through standards. Um, whereas the property graph model is driven by a different need. It's much more of an industry standard. Um, it's it it isn't planned with committees. It's it's grown up over time and different systems implement variations of it and over time they come to a consensus about what the data model is and just at the moment that's coming together quite quite sharply within one particular project that is uh, becoming the de facto reference sense of what it means to be property graphs. So when I talk about property graphs here I'm really referring to um, that particular system and I'll try and bring out the fact that because it's um, emergent standards, there are variations that, that, that go on within that. Um, the the, the centre that this is happening particularly at the moment is an Apache project called uh, Tinkerbop, um, and that's somewhere in the Apache incubator at the moment. Um, they are moving very fast, um, and they're also they're pulling in not only of the Apache projects, but also they're being influential into the commercial systems like Neo4j and, and a number of other ones. And it's an interesting part at the moment because companies are getting bought and sold, there is money flowing, people are interested. So what is a graph? Oh, an RDF graph. Let's go, I'm um, sorry, I'm missed that sign. Okay, so I'm gonna cover these two data models in order. I have an apology, I'm much more on the RDF side. I know much more about that. Uh, I have done some work with property graphs, but I'm more embedded in the in the RDF world. So, um, if you, apologies if it seems a bit skewed. So, what's a graph? And this is true. I mean, a graph is a set of edges and a set of nodes. Mathematical definition, and and it's true for the things. I was I could pick up about what Dave Cliff said, which was interesting. He had a whole lecture on graph databases about computer science being separate from mathematics. Um, this is the parts of computer science that we don't like to say it, but it is quite a lot of maths. And it's useful because those algorithms that work on graphs are known to be extremely expensive to execute. So understanding the algorithmic theory, particularly in the property graphs world, is quite important. But a graph is just a set of links. Uh, and in RDF, a link is also called a triple because it has three parts. It has a subject, the thing you're talking about, it has the predicate, the relationship with something, and the object, the, the thing, the, 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 arc, the edges, 
um, pointing to. Edges have directed in these graphs. So you can talk about uh, me. You can say my name is Andy. Um, me, in this case, is going to be a URI. So that's a, a, a long string that gives me a, a globally unique identifier for me. And when in the RDF and the linked data world they talk about semantics, that's usually the first thing that we're talking about, is giving well-formed, unique names to things. So that when I say my name, it, well, Andy, me, this thing here, has a name Andy, um, you know that it's not because there's somebody else called Andy, popped into a friend of mine who's got the same name, the same given name as me here, so you know which one you're talking about. Um, and if you want to make some other assertion like, um, the talk was given at a particular time by a certain person. You can use my URI there, and you know you are talking about me, not another talk, and it won't be confused with that if it ever encounters something in the data. The predicate is the relationship between the two things. That in RDF is always one of these globally unique names, so that when you say a name of something, it's the name of a person. It's not the... the uh, uh, a name of something else. You can be that specific or you can be general. When you start combining data, um, that's important that things don't accidentally end up referring to the same thing when they didn't mean to, because at that point you will have messed up your data in such a way you will have to start again. Um, you can do a lot of damage to your data. So one of the things that RDF stresses is do no harm when you combine data. It makes sure things are kept apart until you decide that things are the same. Two things can have the same name. No big deal in RDF. Um, it keeps them apart until you say otherwise. So the things that can go, particularly in the object slot, are these long universal names, usual sets of strings, numbers, dates, those sorts of things. And there are some mysterious things called blank nodes which are where standards groups spend most of their time arguing about and actually aren't always that important. Um, and they cause more trouble than possibly they were ever worth. A lot of which is my fault. Um, I, if you get bored in these committees and some of them on the phone, it's a bit boring. I have a standard stock set of questions that I know will give me a chance to wander off and get coffee or something like that while I while they discuss them amongst the theorists. So I just keep a fine cabinet of interesting questions. And there's only really one question you ask, what about blank notes? It's not a good idea. Anyway, this is an RDF graph. So it's got somebody who's, so all those prefix stuff is away because those long names are, well, um, we don't like writing them. So a prefix is the bit before is added to the bit after to produce the long name. So Alice here is actually HTTP colon slash slash example slash my data slash Alice. So that's the name of that node in the graph. FOF is a vocabulary developed originally by people in Bristol, by Libby Miller and Dan Brickley. It's friend of a friend. It's about talking about people and uh, what their names are and what their um, Skype IDs are and email addresses and things like that. But also who you know. So Alice knows Bob to your eyes, and this is the sort of thing. So that, that, that relationship there is defined to say it goes between um, actors in the system. Alice is of type person, RDF colon type, because RDF is one of those prefixes, long name. It's one of the core ones inside the standard, so that's why it's www.w3.org, blah, 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 RDF syntax. So that says Alice has type person. Alice is a person. Good useful thing to know, and she has a name, Alice Smith. So I've said something about Alice. And, and that bit there is the stuff written out in RDF. And yeah, looks like a record. It's a record with fields that you can have any field you like adding on to it. You don't, you're not pres prescribed to some schema unless you choose to be. You can just add stuff and say things, whatever you want about those, those uh, um, those things there. Another little bit. This is about Bob. So somewhere else on the internet, it's bound to be right. So Bob, his first name, Bob Brown, and he's a type of person. So that, that's what that one's saying. That's 
And in RDF, you can combine the data. You just put the two things together. You just concatenate the files, and that would be the graph. It's, I've now combined that data, and I've talked about those people and what they uh, and their names. Data is not much use unless you can get it out again. Um, so this is a query language for RDF, a standard one um, called Sparkle. Same sort of prefixing stuff. Um, somebody who's actually at this conference described it, it must be SQL-like because it begins with the word select. Uh, so select, these are variables, that's a pattern. Find me, for Alice, who, do, who does she know and what names do they have? Because names are more useful to show to people than, than your eyes. Um, and you can write increasingly complicated queries because um, it's a relational algebraic based query language so you can nest things, group things and do all the things that, that you might expect of, of something of that class of languages. And you can update it. So, Slight plug, uh, this is Apache Jenna, top level project to Apache. So there are about 200 odd top level projects. I really put this one in because despite being this talk being branded as being the big data track, um, I just wanted to say in Apache there are a lot of other things other than big data projects. Big data is very active, very um, uh, important within the foundation. I just would like to say there are actually quite a lot of those. Tomcat, for instance, is an Apache project. Um, uh, and some of the other projects feel sometimes they get a bit forgotten. <laughs> He's a click. Um, and there are a number of uh, RDF-related projects. Um, NE23 for converting any kind of data into triples. Marmota is a, a, another RDF system, as is Claretza. Uh, RIA here, well, that is actually a big data system. That is an RDF database built on top of Accumulo with very strong emphasis on security, which comes from running on top of Accumulo. Um, so, yeah may be used in certain institutions we're not allowed to talk about. The property graph model is not defined by a particular document. You can't go and look up the definition of property graph, really. It's, it's become emergent. There are certain systems that have been, that are more influential in driving that and effectively define the model um, so to some extent you have to then go and look at what they do and then extract it out. There are a couple of papers that have written these up in um, applied technology journals. Um, a property graph is a lower level concept. So it's, again it's a set of nodes and a set of arcs, they call them vertexes and edges. All good math graph things, there are different names for the same things. Um, uh, but the difference is, fundamentally, each, each thing in the system gets a unique number. Um, and it's given that number, and then you can add things like properties, with attributes, which are short names and values. So each, um, each vertex, or even each edge in property graph models, one of the big differences, can actually have some characteristics applied to it. Um, and you end up with a directed multigraph. Um, and even a single link is, can be a lot more complicated. So in a property graph database, compared to an RDF database, you have less links because in RDF everything is a link. When you say to a name of a person, to their email address, that's going to be a link. The property graph splits the values and characteristics of things away from the relationships between key concepts in, in the system. Um, and then you could even characterize the relationships within the model, whereas RDF, you have to do it by, by modeling. So we've got something that's the same. Yeah. This, this comes to that. That, that is not a stupid question. Right. I think you've actually come to 
one of the fundamental driving differences between the two the two systems. Um, in fact, in, in two ways. First of all, if you look at RDF as a knowledge management system, RDF is like a SEMBRA. It's really low level. To use it, you build structures on top of it. And one of the structures you can build enables you to capture what you do. So as you wouldn't put on a link, this happened at such and such time, you say, actually, there's something important there. There was an event occurred. So you turn it into a node in the graph and say, Alice sent an email message and point to an event and the event would go to Bob, and you extract that out as part of your data model if it's important to you. Um, the, and in fact, if you look at the graph databases book by the Neo4j people, that is one of the examples in the don't do it this way section of the anti patterns at the back. Because if that ends up with lots and lots of characteristics, it's actually quite difficult to deal with. Um, so you can you can appro you approach the same problem, but you, you use different techniques to get to it. You've also stolen some of my slides Sorry. later on. Don't worry. <laughs> but that 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 shows the different approaches coming in into doing it. Access uh, Tinkerbot Gremlin is a uh, domain-specific language. You can embed. I think that's the. It looks a bit like Groovy. You can do it in Java. Um, Tinkerbob itself is a reference implementation. Reference in a sort of informal sense is, is for any J uh, uh, JVM, so there's closure ones and, and, and stuff. It is driven out of the um, uh, Java ecosystem at, at the moment, um, but the, the general idea is applied in, in, other, in other ones. It's a kind of leading example. And there's a higher level, more i more traditional query language, but a, a query language that you write down and execute as a script rather than write a program to do it, called Cypher, now being turned into, which comes up from Neo4j, from Neo Technology. Um, they are in the process of turning that into a more open system. They're going to still develop the language, but the development process is moving into the open. It's sitting on GitHub somewhere, um, and they're moving slowly, slowly in that way. Um, that's an example. It says do some matching, which will find you some data, and then for each of the things that you uh, in this list, um, take what you found, you is going to be a kind of person, uh, get the friend relationship to them. So it's, it, it's on the same sort of idea that people, particularly people who are not programmers, not all data scientists are programmers, which is, sometimes comes a bit of a shock, um, want to work in languages that are more declarative because they're closer to the way they think about uh, um, think about their data. Um, writing something like these Gremlin scripts is great for programmers, but it's it's not even necessarily the way people think about things. Connection, whereas in RDF everything is at least logically over HTTP, um, the property class world is much more defined by API because. There's less emphasis on data combination and more on capturing semi-structured data going together. And that is also reflected by the way they, how you would combine data in the two systems. There's uh, some Apache stuff. ASF is the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, Tinkerbot, that's just coming in. Um, they're technically in the process of becoming a top-level project, which will happen fairly soon. Apache Spark has a graph engine on top of it. Apache Giraffe, which is the um, implementation of Google's uh, um, uh, box synchronous protocol. Um, Apache Flink, um, another system, has a, a, a specialization in something called Jelly. Um, so there are lots of systems around and happening, and these are big projects. Um, I mean, Apache Spark is simply enormous. Um, but um, So it's another place where, where things are happening. So trying to capture the relationship between the two. Um, the sort of, the anecdotal difference is, if there's an argument about what some data means, in the RDF world, you die for the specs and you find out where the text is and you say, no, it says that, or it says that, and then you argue it that way. In the property graph world, you go and look at the code and say, ah, oh, well, this system does that. And then you say, oh, well, that system does that, which one's right? And then you have a discussion about it. So, those are driven by very different development processes that have happened for, the, for these, these things. 
RDF is about information modeling and information exchange, where the property graphs is much more about analytics, about using the data within a given collection and less about linking it together. So, for example, all your vertexes have unique numbers in property graphs. That means to combine them, you have to make sure that those numbers are not going to um, clash. Surprisingly enough, numbers tend to start at one. So they go one, two, three, four, five, and this data also goes one, two, three, four, five. You can't just put them together without doing a little bit of work to keep them apart um, because there's no reason why actually reading the same data will actually give you the same numbers because it could have done it in a slightly different order. It doesn't matter in the property graphs world, that's just how it works. One of the things that people talk about is lower, layering one model on top of the other. We put property graphs and then use an RDF engine or an RDF graphs on top of property graphs as an engine. But I want to ask why you would want to do that. If the idea is because you exploit the really good capabilities of the underlying system, that means you're going to be able to see the underlying system. So now the person working with the data not only has to work with, say, the RDF model, they also have to know what the implications are of the underlying property graphs model. So now their world has got two of them in. That doesn't make it easy for people to work with. You, you may end up with the best of the best. You also get the worst of the worst. And it becomes a system where it's quite fragile. You can't go and manipulate your data in the underlying technology system because the way the other one was built on top of it needs to remain consistent. If you do it in a different style underneath, you are almost certainly going to break your data. Broken data is quite bad because it's not a case of, oh, my data's broken like a program, you just rerun it. You can break your data in silent ways, in which you will not discover for several months, and then you can't remember what change was made. Data is long-term sticky and persistent. If you break it, if you damage in it, you are in a very dangerous position because it's not like a program that you can rerun. It's something that is pernicious and insidious and has probably driven processes off it and you are going to have to start the game from scratch at some level. So it's not that easy to use one of those sets of tools on top of the others because the reasons you'd want to do it also make it much more complicated for people. But I would say there are things to take from either system. Um, for RDF, if you're going to combine data, use names that when you put data together, don't conflate things. So you don't accidentally have everything about node one over here, which is me, and everything about node one over here, which is one of my pet rats, and combine the system and then find out mine, you know, I've got four legs or something like that. That's what RDF has come out of, that tradition, and it's useful. So put your eyes as real data type objects, which are different from strings, into a combined model, because that's a useful feature. Um, the entire emphasis on data formats for exchange, RDF is very strong on formal syntaxes that you can read right out in one system, read into another, we have never met before, and you will read the same data in down to exactly what the syntax on the wire, uh, in the file is and the squiggly bits and how to deal with international characters and all that sort of stuff. The property graphs world doesn't tend to emphasize data exchange. It doesn't happen very much. So their formats are written on top of XML or JSON or something like that. They tend to encode the details like the numbers because they're more like dump formats so that if you were to restore off that data, you will get the same thing as you put in. But giving it to someone else isn't, you can't just take a database dump and restore it into a completely different database and be absolutely sure it's going to do the same thing and you've actually exchanged data. So that there's some emphasis on, on that. And the query stuff is all based on relational algebra. There was nothing novel about doing it. It was a complete reuse or ripoff or synergy. Isn't there a difference between academia and industry? In academia, it's plagiarism and industry, it's synergy. Um, to, reuse, uh, to reuse stuff. And URIs do matter. I found this on Twitter. I don't know if you can see this very well. That is a large monitor lizard of some kind, a, a gurna, um, and it was heading towards a Newcastle pub. Now, there's a few things to know here. First of all, the good news is this is Newcastle in Australia. 
So we, if I had URI for that place, we'd at least be able to, if the machine were ever looking at this, we'd know that it's not talking about Newcastle upon Tyne or something like that, one of the ones in America, which would be good news if you happen to be in the area. There were some comments like, that would be a really dirt bad day to be on door duty at that pub if that turned up. The other good thing about it is it's not actually known to attack people. Because of that particular variety, particular species, doesn't tend to, to go around and attack people. It's not like the Mado dragons, which are, a bit, which are bigger and a bit more um, aggressive. Um, so your eyes matter. We could find this on Twitter. So what are we talking about here? Well, I, I had to go and look up the name to find out what it is. Um, to know it was about Newcastle in a particular place would be useful. But if you were just capturing information in the UK, you'd probably be a bit more sapdash and just say, it's Newcastle. Things to take from property graphs. The way the links and values are separated um, is much easier for people to use. Um, it happens in the RDF world in a system called OWL, which is one of the layers on top of it, because you, 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 you end up with two kinds of links. Links that are between concepts in your data model and links which are to values, to attributes. Things. And that works very well. It's very natural for people. And it's something that property graph one re re uh, resonates with people a lot better. Um, and short names for those, because they're, they're local characteristics of the thing you're talking about at that point. And it's much stronger on graph algorithms. Um, that's been where the, a lot of the um, applied applications are, so there's actually some quite sophisticated stuff to do that at scale, uh, across machines, in parallel, that doesn't really exist in quite the same way in the RDF world. So, a few conclusions. Now, graphs are still new to a lot of people. Um, RDF emphasizes data modeling. Um, and it's very strong on things like that. For exchange, property graphs emphasize capture of data and algorithms, and they can be used together to produce something better. Layering, I think, will just lead to everybody being upset um, because it's difficult to use, it's clunky, and people don't pay much attention to those parts of, of the system to do it. There's lots of exploration about doing it, and you can find papers to prove it's possible, but what they prove is it's functionally possible, it doesn't tell you it's going to run fast, or it's going to be easy to use, there's practical problems. So they could share technology, storage, data access, query system technology, and our optimizers, which are things that take a long time to develop. Those two, the two communities can, can share those, if just share knowledge, let alone share code. So thank you very much. Um, I've taken longer than I said I would. Um, but thank you very much, and I will take any questions.